I was just given a very general brief, uh, the vision of a sustainable future. And I thought, all right, okay, I'll come along and talk about that, because I have got a lot of ideas, and I have been involved in green politics in the 1970s. Basically, I should have grey hair. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but somehow I haven't quite got the, the grey hairs yet. Um, and... Uh, what I want to do is a little bit of a looking back 40 years since the Green Party was started and looking ahead 40 years. What's the green agenda, green political agenda for the next 40 years? Um, because in many ways things have got a bit stalled. Now, I wasn't here on Friday because I was invited to spend the day with the actual Green Party founders because we were talking about marking, in some way, the 40th anniversary of the Green Party's existence. Now, in those days, it wasn't a political party. And this is an interesting thing to point out, because it goes to the core of what green politics is. Is it about a party in the way that we generally understand it, or is it about doing politics in a different way that is not in the conventional party model? And when the people who set it up, and there was an original gang of four, there was Tony and Leslie Whitaker, there was Mike Benfield and Frieda Sanders, in my view, they've had far more impact on the world than the other gang of four, who are far better known, the founders of the SDP, who set it up and, a, and then were disappeared as a political force within, within, a, within a relatively short period of time. Of course, the people who set up the Green Party in this country were setting up the first Green Party in the world. And so from the beginnings of the Green Party in this country in 1973, it then spread and you saw Green Parties emerging around Europe and around the world. Some of the early ones were in Sweden and the New Zealand Values Party. The first party to actually call itself a Green Party explicitly was the De Grunen, the Greens in Germany. Um, when the, when the, uh, the organisation was first set up in the UK, it was called People. And actually, the colours weren't even green at that point. The colours were turquoise, coral, and white. And the idea of being white is it's the, it's the universal colour. It embraces all colours. And, and, it's the, and it's light, represents light. And then you had turquoise and coral, which are both uh, natural, organic colours, and uh, representing the sea and the earth. So it was seen as a, as a very, and they are very beautiful colours actually. I only realised this, I only learned this on Friday. And because of course when I got involved in 1974, even though those were the official colours, I remember I stood in the elections in 1974 when I was still at school. And I was waving my green towel around because nobody had printed any green banners. And I thought the colours should be green even at that point. And, um, but anyway, that was the origins of the green parties globally around the world. And I would argue that these completely unsung, unknown people who set up the Green Party in this country have had far more influence through doing that than uh, many other people in politics. If you look at the achievements of Green Parties around the world, they are really substantial. They've been in a number of, of governments. You look at the German government now, which has um, decided to close down the nuclear power stations in Germany. And you look at the massive progress that's been made in Germany towards uh, organic farming, towards uh, renewable energy. Um, is it? Somebody's probably got the statistics. Tony, have you got the statistics? The, the, the amount of renewable energy they're now producing in Germany, isn't it something like a quarter or something? I think it's more than that. Is it more than that? Yeah. They're ahead of the game, yeah. And one of the reasons they've done that is because, of course, they've had Greens in government for a very long time. They've taken a very strong position on, on war and peace issues. One of the reasons the Germans did not get involved and support the Iraq war, and many other European countries were, was because the Greens were in government. There was a Green foreign minister. And he just said, no way, Jose. We're not supporting the Iraq war. And actually lobbied hard and engaged in diplomacy to start and stop it happening. Failed ultimately. Um, but that was the, the kind of impact the Greens have had. So I would argue that the original founders of people in this country 
have had a massive impact. But the thing that struck me the most when I met them on Friday was their vision for how politics itself should be. Because their vision was not for a party at all. They realized that you didn't have to be a party at that point to run for an election. You could just put yourself forward and get yourself on the ballot paper. And that's all you needed to do. They call themselves people because they said the problems in the world have been caused by people and they can be solved by people. And, their intent, and they were going to be a coalition of the wider movement. And, and part of what I want to talk about is how I feel the Greens in this country, or at least the Green Party Greens, have made a bit of a mistake in following the conventional party model. And I think in a way this has inhibited the, the wider development, political development of the movement. And the movement, the political movement, could be much stronger and more united um, if the Green Party wasn't doing following quite the same sort of party political model that it has been and is now, is now following. Um, so there was several hallmarks. There was the first, right back in 1973, they set up what they call the Jigsaw Conference, which was to put the bits of the jigsaw together, that is the wider green movement, pull it all together. And the second thing was they decided right at the beginning they weren't going to have a leader, because that was the, the hallmark of a participative, empowering style of politics, uh, where the emphasis is put, you know, you have many leaders, you don't have a single leader. And the other thing was they, they actually said there was going to be no whips when they got into, into Parliament. Because what they wanted to avoid was that kind of corruption in politics you get, where we know that people aren't speaking their truth. You know, somebody stands up there, they speak the party line, and no matter how well trained they are as a politician, something, on some level, we understand that they don't really believe what they're saying. And that's led to a massive disenchantment and disengagement with politics. Because you're not getting people's authentic, committed voices coming through. I mean, you are in some cases, but in many, many cases amongst the professional political elite, you're not. And I think that has led to the impoverishment of politics as a whole. If people speak their truth, then we're going to get a lot of different outcomes. And you're not going to find people bound as much as they are to corporate or other vested interests. So that was a hallmark of very early green politics. You didn't have the whipping, um, and you allowed people to speak their truth. And that actually is still a, a Green Party policy, and uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to say. So though now we've come to a point where, with the Green Party, I just said it's 40 years old next year. So. The, the foundations of the Green Party about 40 years ago was sort of this time of year when those, the original Gang of Four were having their first early meetings, meeting up in pubs in Coventry where they all lived. They were kind of sort of solicitors, estate agents, professional types. But at that time, the West Midlands was facing um, a serious manufacturing crisis. You know, engineering was going down the tubes. And they were looking at uh, the beginnings of the oil crisis and, and, and starting to understand the environmental crisis. It was a, a fertile time because during that same time you saw the startup of Greenpeace, startup of Friends of the Earth, around that time you had Survival International, you had quite a range of other groups. So there was a whole movement that was happening and we are now coming to a time literally 40 years away where it's time to reflect. So what I think, what I hope the Green Party will do next year is reflect on the last 40 years and look ahead to what the green politics of the future will be. Because many, many of those ideas that were being pushed 40 years ago are now quite mainstream in terms of the discussion. You think of renewable energy, uh, organic farming, public transport. I'm talking about more of the environmental agenda rather than the sort of wider green agenda here. But a lot of those ideas are actually mainstream. Whereas when I started out, it was complete regarded as lunacy. I remember talk, trying to talk to a farmer about organic farming. He just hadn't got a clue what I was talking about. He thought I was talking about magic. You know, and I, you, you, couldn't, you can't now comprehend what people's headspaces were 40 years ago and how far out and wild some of the things we were saying at that time were regarded. What I would like to do today as we, as we go through this is to get into those wild, far-out ideas now. 
the ideas that will be, we hope can be mainstream in 40 years' time. So what's the really cutting-edge, radical vision of green politics in the year, 20, in the year 2012? No money. Good. Thank you. I like that one, and that will feed into what I'm going to talk about. We've got a radio mic. If anybody wants to say anything, yeah. Let, let me just say, by the way, that because I'm so keen on participative politics, if you want to jump up and heckle, <laughs> right, or or contradict me or come up with another idea, take us on, on, on a different tangent, tangent, within reason. <laughs> I think that's great. I'm sure, I'm sure it gets too wild, Donna's gonna kind of get up and arm twist and you know, escort you out. <laughs> um, well, one of the, you, you were mentioning that uh, uh, it, it, it was a shame that they'd uh, adopted a, a po sorry. You, you said the, the Green Party adopted a policy of of um, uh, being, a, being a political party, mm. and you prefer it just be a co coalition of, 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 of um, non-conformists, if, if, if you like. Um, I, I imagine the reason for it was because the media is so influential that in order to be get representation on the television, radio, etc., you you have to be a political party, and to get that representation. I'm, I'm speculating, but... Um, I think that, you speculate quite correct. It's uh, it's, so that might be a determining factor, which is wrong, yeah. but... No, I think you're quite right. I think you've and also, you know, getting maybe political funding might be another issue. I, I think you're quite right, and I think that, that very often the Green Party and all political parties have allowed their agenda to be shaped by the media. Um, I think that's quite correct, and their structures and the way they operate. Um, you know, but my argument is that the, the goal should really be about empowerment and mass participation. And ultimately, it's about real politics. It's about actual people and how we engage people and affect change in our in our wider communities. That should be the goal. Uh, yeah, that sounds wonderful. And I yeah. think 40, year, 40 years has resulted in many, as you say, of course. It's interesting, if you look at what, how, how the German Greens got set up, they did not have what you might call the vanguardist approach of the UK Green Party. Because in Germany, you had a whole range of uh, organizations embedded in their communities, autonomous local community groups, Bundesgenetzen they were called. And actually many of them coalesced together in order to fight nuclear power back in the 70s. And then they found they were actually really effective in mobilizing large numbers of people. And actually, it was out of that that the Greens emerged. And over there, they didn't call themselves a party, right? It wasn't like the SDP, Social Democrat Party. They were just called the Greens. And it was a network or a confederation of autonomous local groups. Um, so you don't have to follow the conventional model in order to be successful, because, of course, the German Greens are the most successful you know, Greens in Europe. Um, Anyway, just to give you a, a little taste of the sorts of things I'd like to get into as we kind of dive into this uh, this morning. Yes? Um, yeah, go on. Yeah. Um, I think that there should be rationing, like in the Second World War, of things like um, plane flights and meat and stuff like that. Yeah. And also, um, I came at the 10 minutes after you'd begun. Are you, are you the founder of the Green Party? I'm not actually, no. There, there, is a, there is a gang of four, but I was very early, very early, yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, um, I voted Green um, ever since I voted. Yeah. Nothing else, yeah. So. Yeah, I think, I think I wasn't actually quite, quite old enough. I, was, I was stood in a school election in 1974 when I was 16. So, Excellent. Well, and the founders so were probably already in their late 30s by then. Yeah. When, when did it start? 1973. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so next year is the 40th anniversary. Wow. Brilliant. Thank you. Could you just say something during your talk about um, progression from the Ecology Party to the Green Party as well? Because I, I was first introduced to the Ecology Party when I was at school at a mock election, which got wow. on John Craven's wow. news wow. Um, but. 
yeah, beyond the obvious symbolism and things like that back then, um, I really like what you say more about um, the Bund, this 990 or whatever, other groups within the Greens of Europe, not just... Well, let me, just, let me just say a little bit about that right now. Uh, because I think it's very important that we don't just try and engage with the yeah. politics as it is in this country. After all, we want proportional radicalisation. We want to see a radical yeah. change in the way politics is worked and done. Yeah. Um, whoever we are, if, if you, we are, if you like, because we just need to get the votes in at the end of the day yeah. to get past that post. And uh, also, um, yeah, I'd like to see something radical like permaculture instead of farming or, or veganism? <laughs> well, there was actually two major name changes because uh, when it was set up, it was just called people. And, and then there was a feeling, okay, well, that the policies we're talking about are actually ec ecological. So there was the change of the name, which was proposed by Teddy Goldsmith, who was current, at that time editor of The Ecologist magazine, and he said, let's just call it ecology. Because that is the core, you know. It's it's uh, it, right from the beginning. It was an economic message, and it was about challenging uh, mainstream growth economics. And I don't know if you you're, probably, you're not old enough, but um, there was a 1972. There was the ecologist had a special edition called Blueprint for Survival, and actually it looked at where we were going. We followed current trends on resource consumption, energy consumption, and so forth, and it just made the point that how society was, was simply not sustainable. And that was where this whole key thing of sustainability came from. It was the Greens saying, the way we are running our economy, the way we're running our world, is not sustainable. And we're going to hit various crisis points, various crashes, inevitably. And actually, that document was debated in Parliament. It was taken very seriously over a wide range of media. And it was one of the, the key documents that led to the founding of what then became the Green Party. But in between, we had the Ecology Party, because that, that was felt at that point to be the core and central issue. But it became clear that there was several problems with being called the Ecology Party. One was that a lot of people hadn't got a clue what it meant. We have to try and go out on the stump, or you go out, you know, knocking on people's doors. I'm from the Ecology Party. You know, most people go, mm hmm? You know, other people, you know, go to go university says, well, hang on, that's like they're calling yourselves the Sociology or the Pathology Party. It's, it's an academic discipline. You can't exactly call yourself the ecology party. We were trying to create a whole new meaning for a word that people actually didn't even know in the first place. So it was a bit of a tough sell. The people who did get it just thought it meant environmentalism. And of course, we were never just about environmentalism. It was fundamentally about an economic analysis and an economic, a new economic approach, sustainable economics. But also it embraced the wider social agenda because this kind of radical thinking affects the way we live in all areas, not just in what is now kind of pigeonholed as the environment. Um, so then we had uh, that movement, and it was also a question of playing catch up with some of the other emerging Green parties. It was felt that, that Green was just a slightly sexier name. So, okay, well, let's call ourselves the Greens. Uh, and that was how the shift was actually made. But preceding that in this country, you had got Greenpeace and you had got the Green Gathering. The Green Gathering is actually the first uh, organisation in the UK to use the word green in its modern contemporary political sort of meaning of the word. So, in, then, um, so it came out of the Green Gatherings and then that then was one of the inspirations for the, uh, for the Ecology Party as it was to change its name. Okay. Anyway, I want to touch, as I said, uh, as we go through, to touch on a few more sort of radical areas for the future. I want to look at the sort of the, those things that might be considered a bit mad now, but things that are going to, I think, become mainstream over the next 40 years. Looking at the whole issue of consumerism and what is the alternative to consumerism. And I want to talk about what I call the politics of intimacy, which is providing a, a human goal, a source of fulfillment that is radically different from consumerism. Consumerism is the, is the motivator, it's the, the, the channel for our, our economic illness. It's what's killing the planet. It's the of an endless list of cravings and needs which actually we didn't know we had until they were presented to us. So I think we have to look more fundamental than conventional politics at what is actually going to meet real human needs. And then we have to bring that into the political sphere. Wants rather than needs. Yeah, it's not what needs, it's wants. Crazy than wants. OK, 
Okay? Creation of ones. Yeah? Creation of ones. Um, so that was sort of kind of one area I'd like to explore a little bit. Um, and up, yeah, go on. Sorry? Yeah. Probably not. <laughs> I mean, we can explore all that. Actually, I'm, to be honest, I'm more of the, you know, um, what's he called? Is he Jim Watson, the NASA guy? Yeah. I don't really want to talk about climate change here because you, you, you have to take the view. Um, you either say, okay, we're all shot now, um, and actually, what are we going to do? Just kind of give up, fly to, you know, take lots of long distance flights. Or if there's, if there's even a minuscule place to hope, to believe that things can be turned around, then you have to engage with that. Um, so I think we, we have to keep, keep on keeping on. Um, and, and, and the kind of changes that we need you know, are still needed. And actually, the, 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 the crux of what I want to say is, is about empowerment politics, participation, as a way of mass mobilization in a relatively short period of time. How do you engage the wider population in, in effective change, in political change, in a short period of time? We have to think outside the box, essentially, because none of the ways we're working are really achieving that right now. So it's about bringing forward radical ideas to you know, enable mass mobilization. Uh, in the face of uh, massive uh, corporate um, influence, control over political systems as they currently exist. Okay, um, so to get on to that core vision, get back to that core vision, you've got those founders of people and they are talking about uh, creating a coalition, a confederation, a network of the wider movement. They're talking about a particip participant. They're talking about uh, an authentic politics where people speak their truth. I no party whips. Now, the whole idea of empowerment, I think, is is key for all of us. And because we have very little time available, so and ultimately we have to look at what is going to engage every single one of us individually. Politics, I think, in the sense of the mass, the whole, the machine. Um, and ultimately, it comes down to you and me, to everybody out there, and how they think, and what motivates them, what gets them off their butts, what gets the people engaged. And it's as much to do with the heart as it is to do with the head. In fact, probably more to do with the heart than it is to do with the head. And it's to do with your sense of self-worth, your ability to affect change. Now, I know they've done research on this, and they discovered that political activists generally are happier than the, than, the, than the broad mass of the population. They've also done correlations between um, uh, health and finance, how rich you are, and they found that people who've got more money can afford more health care and are generally healthier than people who are poor. But the fascinating information for me is the fact that the power in inequality has a greater influence on our health than financial inequality. People who feel empowered, people who feel in control of their lives, who can affect the communities, who are appreciated within their communities, they have greater health outcomes than people who don't. In other words, there is a direct correlation between power and health. And we understand how body and mind are intimately connected. There is so much evidence out there now. And if we can actually change our hearts and our heads, that will affect our bodies. So ultimately, I think what I'm proposing is quite a radical idea, which is that personal development and personal empowerment is intrinsically political. And we have to bring these ideas into the political mainstream. And that is at the heart of what I'm proposing as the green agenda moving forwards. And if we can bring these ideas in, and if we can create the structures that enable this to happen, 
If we can use government at all levels to facilitate this, this is going to have, uh, it could potentially have very rapid benefits in terms of harnessing human potential and our ability to affect change. And in fact, it is the only thing, ultimately, that will create change, especially in the time that we have, if we do, the time that we have available. So that was that point. And from that, of course, you get a whole range of policies. Uh, devolution, localism, if, if that word has not been corrupted. <laughs> um, democratization and participation. And there's many different techniques, uh, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with many of them, for pursuing all of those kind of policies. But ultimately, I'm looking for something that goes deeper than all those political policies, something that actually engages us personally and individually. Okay, so that's the, if you like, the, the, the first... Yeah, something that you, you, talked, uh, you talked about that, um, that reminded me of something that I've been thinking about for a long time, and, and, and that is in my sort of anarchist nature doesn't want to tell people what to do, but if I were to be in a position where I could make it in some way, I would, I would choose to, to find a way to give people more time, because the things that you talk about and the thoughts that many activists have are kind of beyond the, they're, they're not th things that people have had time to reflect on. Um, and it feels, it feels to me like a, the, the time to actually think about what we want to do is what most people don't have. And I just wonder if you've got any perspectives on that. Actually, I love curry time. Have you come across curry time? Curry time is the Aboriginal notion of time, which is there is time for everything, and for everything there is a time. And actually, it's, it's a very different way of looking at time from the sort of linear Western concept of time, you know, where days are just divided up into little segments. And they think that that's a way of creating more time. In fact, it takes time away from you. Because time is an elastic concept. I mean, that's my sort of personal view. And I do agree, yes, I'm speaker's one who's constantly running around. And actually, time ultimately is, is the wealth. And you know, it also comes down to the mind and body. If you can create time in your life, then, then that is a greater source of wealth than, 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 than money, monetary wealth, in my view, yeah. Um, just the thing on time, I was at the Copenhagen Summit, and I remember um, talking about time, and, and one, of the, um, one of the big things that could help save the planet is if we all had more recreation time. We spend so much time working mm. to earn money, to consume, and that one of the big things is if we just actually planned more recreation across the world, we would stop consuming so much, and uh, so uh, time is such an important factor. Yeah, we all spend more time at festivals, really. <laughs> and yeah. More people come to festivals. I mean, I would say that there is a very important point about festivals, because, of course, when people gather together, they empower themselves. And when people are separated and isolated and sitting at home watching those little black and white boxes in the corner, or colour ones these days, <laughs> showing show my age again, um, when, then you're just absorbing. You are a consumer. And, um, but when you meet together in groups, you're participating. And actually it creates, uh, it creates space, and it creates new ideas, and a sense of our collective empowerment. So I'm a huge fan of festivals, um, for exactly that reason. I set up the Green Gathering years ago. And then, uh, since then, I've been just pushing. So I'm, you know, I'm a big fan of Sunrise, because it's following in the same tradition of trying to pull people together motivate people and get people together and co-organized and ultimately I'd like to see festivals like this looking at particular political outcomes, looking to achieve particular political goals. Okay, we always had this idea around the green gatherings that they were the greens are gathering. And we look and the, obje the political objective was to bring together um, sort of movements for political development, uh, women's movement, men's movement, Pull together the peace movements uh, and the wider movement for, for non-violence, um, ecology, environmental movements, social justice movements, a whole range of social groups that are out there in the wider community. The idea of the Green Gathering was to pull all these different social movements together um, under one kind of overall um, political philosophy. And so that all these different social movements could see that they were fundamentally interconnected and that they could actually begin to, to work more closely together. And I think the Green Gathering actually, because it was the first, or one of the early first organizations attempting to do that back in 1980, it was uh, one of the kind of embryonic organizations in the creation of what we now regard as the Green Movement. So yes, 
let's have more recreation because of course what do we do with our recreation we sit down with each other and we talk and we deepen our connections with each other and we have the opportunity through analyzing how we live our lives to deepen our understanding uh, and to develop a bit of this up here rather than just absorbing you know what the what the little box in the corner of the room wants to tell us yeah yeah go on you said that the Great Gathering um, came about, of course you have to sort of call it. <laughs> yeah. uh, you said you found the Green Gathering, but pre previously you said that the Green Gathering um, was around before the Ecology Party. And you're not old enough for that. Be before the Green Party. For the, before it the was. Uh, before the, it was. The, the, green, the Green Gathering's first name was the Ecology Party Summer Gathering. That's what it was uh, called. I see, I thought, yeah, I, I'm and then, and then it changed its name from the, being the Ecology Party Summer Gathering in 1980. In 1982, it, it changed its name to the Green Gathering. And then after that, the Ecology Party changed its name to the Green Party. So yeah, the Green Gathering was using the, the word green in its new sense before the Green Party was. Um, OK. <laughs> Sorry, it's all a bit arcane, isn't it, all of that stuff for, for somebody. Okay, let me get on to an, an, a next aspect of what you might call the, the rap, uh, looking 40 years ahead. And I want to talk about land and, and our relationship to land, our understanding of land and the meaning of land in our lives. And if you look at the, the major influences on the way we think, uh, such as Christianity, you know, we're traditionally a Judeo-Christian uh, country. And, uh, and what the Christian view of land is. In its, most, in its best form, it's of, it's of stewardship, essentially. But it's still of humans having dominion over the land and its creatures. And so that's one. I would say that if you look at the, the sort of the capitalist view of land, then of course land is seen fundamentally as a resource. And everything that land produces, its trees or its animals or its grass, or its minerals, these are all resources to be harnessed to the productive process. That's the kind of the capitalist view of land. And then of course you've got the Marxist view of land, which is more or less the same. But then it's looking at the, the, at the countervailing force, which is labor. So you've actually got labor and you've got uh, resources, you've got capital. Um, and land does not come in as a separate force in a Marxist analysis. Um, so all these are all kind of major bearings on the way in which we think. And I think it's absolutely vital for green politics moving forward that we look at <coughs> land itself as a concept because, of course, land ultimately produces everything that we depend upon for life. It is the biosphere. And we can change, we can it change the way we think about economics. So instead of just thinking about capital and labor, Let's turn it into, instead of two forces, let's think of three, capital, labor, and land. And maybe if uh, economics was taught in that way, that would actually change things quite fundamentally as well. And maybe we can go deeper than that, and we look at what our understanding of land is. I mean, there was always that, 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 uh, that quote, remember that guy, Chief Seattle? who I don't think ever existed, or it was supposed to be a false quote, everybody said later on. But, um, but he said, we do not belong to the earth. The, no, hang on. <laughs> the, earth does, the earth does not belong to us. We belong to the earth. He put it that way around. And I think if we see ourselves as belonging, and we understand how corrupted our society has become, because we actually, as a society, we believe that land can be owned. We think of land ownership, we talk about land ownership. Oh, I own a bit of land. In other words, you put land in the same category as a car, or a jumper, or a pair of boots. Whereas fundamentally, it is utterly different. You know, as they also in that Chief Seattle quote, how can you know, we own the birds and the bees? We can't. You know, that idea is strange to us. So when we start to change our relationship, our understanding, and we bring that into politics, and we look at the kind of politics that can express that, we will change that fundamentally. And I would make the first point about 
What is land ownership? Actually, in this, in this country, what you buy is a holding. You don't buy the land itself. You buy a freehold or you buy a leasehold. You buy a holding. And that concept of holding is actually far better because it, holding gives you responsibilities. It gives you a duty of care. Ultimately, I think land is owned notionally by the sovereign, by the state, by the people. Or we could even say that land owns itself. It is the Mother Earth. But all we buy as human beings is a holding with certain rights and certain obligations that can be attached to it. So I would give that, because that is actually something that we have in, in English law that is a great asset. But if we can start talking about that and using the word holding instead of the word ownership when we discuss land, that that will actually have uh, an influence itself as it spreads out. The second thing I would mention in, in the context of changing the way we view land is, to, is a, a Green Party policy that's been around since early days. It's called land value taxation. And some of you might have come across that. Um, because this is where you replace council tax, essentially, with a thing called land value taxation, which um, is a tax on the use of land. And in that way, you can help uh, steer and influence different usages of the land. So, for example, you would zero rate a nature reserve. Or you could uh, give a very, very, a much lower rate to organic farming than you would to highly intensive chemical farming. Um, it's a simpler way of being able to have some influence and control politically on behalf of the wider community, the eco community as well as the human community. And you can determine not only land use, but in theory, you could also um, influence and determine the size of land holdings. And if you think of the, you know, we probably all read the statistics of whatever it is, you know, 1% of the population owns 50% of the UK countryside. You know, there's some, hot, I mean, I, I actually don't know the exact statistic, but, you know, it's something, something like that. And, um, and we could actually start, over a period of time, to affect the size of land holdings by introducing land value taxation. So I just mentioned that as, as a couple of sort of policy directions, the way in which you can bring a really radical notion of, of land as a holding, you can bring that in and you can start to have political policies that are going to bring in a new understanding of Earth into the political system. Okay, so that is like, if you like, radical agenda number two. Radical agenda number three is what I would call ecocentrism. And this is where I actually think the founders of the, uh, of the party got it wrong, because they called it people. In other words, they gave it a very anthropocentric name right from the beginning. Anthropocentric, meaning just putting human beings at the center of your understanding of the world. Whereas, of course, what ecology has taught us is that we are just one strand in the great web of life. Um, you know, that we are a mammal, we have evolved in the same way that all other mammals have evolved, and that when we see ourselves fundamentally as one strand within the web, that actually starts to affect everything else that we see around us. Now, I've been putting some sort of radical thoughts, maybe not the sort of thing I'd normally use on the stump if I was out knocking on the door to win votes for the Green Party currently, but something that we should be talking about, which is what kind of policies would enable nature to have a voice in our political system. If we really believe in ecocentrism, you know, if, if that is part of our understanding of, of who, who we are as, as human beings, what we are as a species, how do you reflect that in politics? How do you have a, what kind of a voting system? Uh, what, how, how do you have what kind of boundaries? Uh, who votes? Right now, it's only human beings who vote. Okay. Here's a radical idea. Um, why don't we give the f nature a voice in our legislatures? You know, we're undergoing House of Lords reform now. Okay, where's the voice of nature in House of Lords reform? If it's only human beings with an anthropocentric outlook, then that is, those are the policies that are going to be approved. Okay, I'm putting out some radical ideas here, but why not? You know, these are the kind of ideas that could be mainstream in you know, in the future. 
I would like to see boundaries. We've got boundary, constituency boundary reviews going on right now. I would like to see boundaries that reflect, reflect natural boundaries, bioregions, watersheds, mountain ranges, you know, the Somerset Levels, the Mendip Hills. These, these are natural bioregions. Well, why not have them as the boundaries for our electoral divisions as well? So that you're representing a particular, a particular, um, a particular biological type, a particular ecosystem is represented in legislatures. And I would go even further than this, and I would say, well, we've now got a lot of skills and ways we can discover the voice of nature. Uh, shapeshifters in Native American uh, thinking and their traditions and their religion. People who can take on the thinking and the being of an animal. And sometimes, you know, in the process of their rituals, they even start to become those animals. There's a lot of skills and thinking and history embedded in shapeshifting. What about, who's heard of family constellations? Ever come across family constellations? Family constellations is a kind of a new technique out there, which is quite extraordinary. We're looking at um, uh, healing wounds within uh, your families ancestral wounds that of course we carry with us but we can go further than just looking at healing human wounds we can actually start to look at the wider community just to explain simply how family constellations work what you do is people if you were to take on um, you wanted to look at a wound in your in your family history then what you do is you invite other people in the group to take the role of different people in your family. So grandfathers, uncles, mothers, fathers. And you stand, you know, you have one person stood there, another person stood there, another person stood there, and you stand in relation to each other. Okay, so me, I was, my mother, uh, I was much closer to my mother than I was to my father. So I would actually have there, and I'd have my mother here, my father would be somewhere over there. And, and then you'd have the other children in relation. And the extraordinary thing is that when you start to map out uh, the relationships between individual members of families, then the people who are playing those parts start to have feelings and thoughts of what it must have been like to be that other person. Because we're all very similar, ultimately. And those insights that come from those other people acting, the roles of the other members of the family, um, can actually bring about great insights. So, that, it's, it's a radical thing, it's out there, it's happening, people get phenomenal healing from family constellations. So my more radical notion is to introduce the idea of eco-constellations, ecological constellations, to have people actually taking on the position and the role of uh, the creatures of, of nature. You know, you could be a fish, you know, you could be a bird, you know, you could be a mammal. We all act out these different creatures in relationship to each other within an ecosystem. Okay, and then somebody else comes along, they're a logger, and they want to come along. And, uh, and then you get the feelings and the reactions from people who adopt the positions of those different wild creatures. So you can have a system of eco-constellations. Okay, I warned you I was going to be a bit far out here, and, but this is looking at the kind of ideas that are very radical right now, in the same way that 40 years ago, renewable energy and organic agriculture were, were mad, wacky, and far out. Sorry? You know the children's book, The Animals of Farthing Wood? Um, I don't, but I think I, I do uh, vaguely. It was about rabbits and badgers that their field was having a motorway built through it or something like that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And watership down as well. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, that was from the point of view of the animals and that came out quite a long time ago and a lot of children would have read it. So it's sort of a bit similar. Mm. Yeah. Well, we have that capacity as human beings because we are just part of life itself anyway. When we put ourselves in a position of somebody else, we can start to feel and experience what that other person 
um, is experiencing. Um, and then we can bring that into our own understanding. It takes us outside of, of self-centeredness and it gives us a, a greater eco-centeredness, if you like. So, hence, eco-centric um, constellations. It's a radical idea. Okay, let, let, let me. Let, I'll, I'll share, share a fantasy with you. Okay, this, this is not, this is not real, not real politics. But the fantasy is, it, House of Lords reform is going on right now. Okay, instead of just saying, okay, we want all the human beings to be elected by proportional representation, what about saying, actually, we want to have the voices of nature. We want to have the insects. We want to have the fish. We want to have the birds. We want to have the bears. We want to have their voice heard in our upper chamber. So then you would actually have uh, the poets, the actors, the shapeshifters, the people who had these ability to connect with the forces of nature would come in, would almost like take on the spirit of that animal and then actually give voice to what those creatures are feeling. So that each time a new policy came forward, then you had those forces of nature having to uh, hear what the new proposal would do to them. And then, the, you know, so suddenly you would then say, well, the, the, the fish, you know, the, the new laws on fishing, okay, well, that's going to affect my species, it's not going to affect my species. You can actually get it, you can hear it more genuinely, authentically, from the, from the voice of nature. Yeah. It, it's already happening in some places. Joanna Macy does a thing called the Council of All Beings. Yeah. When she's designing and working on development projects, it's a thing where they try and at least bring in the voice of the ecosystems that are being affected in, in making the decisions about the design of the development and stuff. So there are some places where, where it's practic you know, it's happening in at least some yeah. of the sort of like development decision making, but I, I don't think it's a ridiculous idea at all to bring it into into our wider decision making, you know, in, and actually indigenous communities historically, like you say, the shape shifting and one of the things was the children's fire that the indigenous communities always had, always making decisions and thinking about the effects for the seventh generation and this is what's missing from our decision making, yeah. which is why we're in such a mess. Thank you. And, and I'm so glad to hear that you say that because Joanna Macy is a star and, uh, and she should be more widely known and the Council of Beings are likely to spread more widely. And, um, and yes, let's take that kind of thinking into, into mainstream politics. Yeah. I've, I've worked a lot in, um, in schools and a little bit in colleges. Yeah. Um, but um, I just think, you know, to, to, if we have this 40 years, and maybe we do have some of it, but I think a great place, place of foundation for that way of thinking will be to, I mean, that's just a lovely thing. I mean, I know it's always lovely to look at the, you know, making movies and stuff like that, but if you can actually take a technique into a classroom and get kids, yeah. you know, this sounds like a lovely way of, of interacting with kids. And if you could change school policy and just bring this in as a way of for children to just start sharing that way. I mean, it's a beautiful thing. And then maybe by the time they're in their teens and early 20s, then mm -hmm. it really could, you, we really could see it. But I, I also think as well, as well as working in the classroom environment, my, my niece takes a, um, an art project into all sorts of communities ar around the world. Mm -hmm. And um, I think this sort of thing is the sort of thing that you, with, I don't know, if you can find that platform in a, you know, a, a, a normal community centre or a gallery in the middle of a city mm -hmm. and, and, and invite people to come and do this as a workshop, I think it's the sort of thing, you know, mm -hmm. maybe slightly outside, not to first stand and say, look, this is what we want to see happening in the House of Lords, because they'll laugh us off. But, you know, but I think that's a, there's an amazing, there are ways of getting this kind of thing into both the classroom and schools, but also into community centres as a way for people to come and meet and discuss, aren't they? Not, not just as green hippies. Yeah. Well, actually, what I, what I dug was when you said, yeah, I, I felt you say, you could really see that. Yeah, it's right? And I, you, you, in other words, you got to that point where you can see it. There's me saying, this is a radical far out idea, I'm looking 40 years ahead. And you saying, I can see it, like almost like, I'm going to go home and make this happen in my community next week. And suddenly, the process of change can be speeded up. 
and we can bring the voices of nature, ecocentrism, into politics, into our schools. I think to change the way, to change the national curriculum, to change the way schools are running, you have to engage in the politics at the same time. Um, but yeah, I'm right with you. Go on. Um, hi, I, feel, I, um, I strongly agree with most of the things that you've been saying, and a lot of what you're um, talking about reflects my experience of the last 20 years, and in particular a trajectory from a, a more materialist view of my existence to a more spiritual emphasis. And I, yeah. I'm interested in, um, I mean, the strands that you picked out seem to me to be to move through that trajectory. You know, talking about a more material, people having a more materialist view of their lives or a materialist understanding of their being here towards a more spiritual vision of life, including our economics and our resource management and so on. Um, but then in doing that, there seems to me to be a desire to make spirituality the province of politics, rather like things might have been previously. So I'm interested to know um, how you might think we could, the lady over here has mentioned narrative forms are a powerful way of inspiring people to follow a vision in a way that's not uh, you know, part of the normal political discourse. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering what ideas you have specifically for implementing that kind of change in practice. You know, in the in the in the in the commons, in the the ordinary sort of media distorted discourse that actually takes place. I I think you 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 you're bang on the button <laughs> because I the our spirituality uh, shapes our values. And it shapes the way in which we function in the, in the wider community. Um, I run a, my, my, my main business is I run a, a little business called the Earth Spirit Center. And so the, and I set that up uh, 25 years ago to look at ways in which we could um, bring the, the spirit, if you like. I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about spirituality in its much wider sense. Uh, to bring that into the way in which we, we lay. Because there's, there are so many spiritual traditions that uh, view nature as intrinsically part of us, not as something that's separate. Um, it, it's not a question of you know, bringing formal education into schools, formal religious education into schools. I think it's about something cultural shifting. And actually, I think it's already happening in, in, a, in a very big way. You've got so many different sort of pagan groups out there now for whom, at their heart, the, um, the kind of the magic of, of nature, the, what's the right word, the sort of the spirituality of nature, you know, that it's not just a resource. It's got something of intrinsic spiritual value. You know, here we are, stood on the earth, you know, this is the soil, and underneath here, there's there's, there's worms and there's creatures and there's there's all of life. Uh, so it's it's a, it's a cherishing, it's an understanding, and yes, we can bring that forward. We can support that through a political process too. We can allow space for it, but I don't know how much you could make that a sort of formal political thing. I feel I'm a bit rambling in answer. You've probably got a better answer to your own question no, no, than I no, have. I, I think that's where the nub of the issue lies, that, that intersection. I mean, if Henry broke, the, broke the, the arrangement in the first place, then we need to Speaking remember it. Sorry, so you're going to have to repeat that with a microphone. <laughs> um, I think that's the, the, the difficulty here, the nub of the thing does lie in how to lace these things back together. And if Henry broke the arrangement in the first place, finally, Mm. Um, and we want to sort of remember what we had before that, but somehow make it relevant to a global vision. Yeah. And then we have to find a way of lacing these things together so that it doesn't seem an you know anathemic on the door on the stump, as you say, to be discussing people's beliefs and values at the core of their being, alongside their economic preferences and the fact that they're struggling to make ends meet as a self-employed plumber or whatever it happens to be. They need to be part of the same discourse, but we've sort of lost our cultural capacity for that way of seeing, it seems to me, mostly. We're regaining it, I hope. I mean, I've recently, I suppose, I've, I've renewed in my optimism about that again after several years in the wilderness myself. Well, one of the reasons I have to say that I, I set up the Earth Spirit Centre was I, was I was getting a little disillusioned with uh, the political process, um, but I was still as committed to affecting change in the world. And because what I found was you can make any number of intellectual arguments, and it goes in one ear and out the other. 
So how do you affect the way people actually think and how the way they act? You've got to change people's values, the things that they hold closest. And that sense of uh, uselessness, lack of engagement, lack of spiritual context uh, was, was what was motivating me. So I thought, well, okay, I, I wanted to create a center where, very simply, people could come from all different traditions. You know, it doesn't, doesn't mind what of each tradition, that aspect that recognizes our intrinsic harmony and connectedness with the natural world. I suppose where I haven't quite got an answer at all is, is where you would tie that in to, or how you could use political mechanisms to support that process that's already going on. You know, because I don't think you're going to have state religion, um, you know, where you force the teaching of pagan mantras in every school. Um, I wouldn't, that wouldn't be quite our way, would it? But anyway. Hi, I, I'm, I was just going to say, um, for me, I, I know exactly what you're trying to say. And by the way, I think the Earth for its centre is absolutely beautiful, fantastic. I've really enjoyed staying there. Thank you. Um, but in terms of uh, changing people's values, I think it's more uh, a case for me of reclaiming and remembering our values. Yes. Um, because, and, and I think that's where faith and um, different kinds of ways of call, to call people to, to reconnect to the earth, um, I feel one of the ways is just the simple things of kind of gathering in circles. We, we need to sort of change our forums, our ways of, of meeting. So, for example, even here, of where possible, rather than the panel speakers and then the passive audience, to have the circle, to have more of the gem general assembly kind of ways that Occupy use, where they engaged everybody and everybody has a deep wisdom. But other than that, in terms of the simple spiritual um, connections that everybody can comes as a call to action, is is you know the fire. That's why people come to the festivals to be on the land, to sit in circles, to be around a fire. And I think it's it's kind of just getting. We need to get much much more simple and mm. just uh, enable, enable people to reconnect. Well, I love your idea of remembering because actually I think we have ancestral memory in all of us. Uh, and sometimes all you need is the right cues, and actually it will trigger distant memories. Um, and we think, gosh, where did that come from? You know, and suddenly you, your awareness changes. And the other thing is, is, is extraordinary, is how our awareness, how our uh, collective mentality changes uh, quite rapidly over time. And then we can't really quite remember how it was 20 or 30 or 40 years ago. You know, when I can remember meeting a guy, and, and he was the first bloke to grow his hair long in the town he lived. He lived in Oxford, first bloke to grow his hair long. And he said he used to be stoned in the street when he went out. Literally stoned, and I don't mean <laughs> stone stoned. <laughs> I mean, he literally had bits of brick and stuff. He couldn't go out of his house. Because uh, the, the hostility to one man growing his hair long was so strong that, that he couldn't go out of his house because he, he used to get stoned in the street. Um, and yet now, for us to kind of imagine that hostility, things change. It's, and they change in subtle ways because society changes. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, you you commented um, about uh, land value taxation and ecocentrism. To me, it's to actually do land value taxation, it's very complicated and administratively very expensive. I'm a farmer and I, you know, the last figure I saw for the single payment claim was about £800 to administer each claim. And what, you actually, what we're trying to achieve is positive outcomes. It's not about process. So yeah. in terms of doing that, you say, okay then, and everyone cheats. Conventional farmers cheat, organic farmers cheat. And in terms of checking for cheats is that the ministry basically says we will all get 10% of all the farmers every year. So what they do is you all get 10% of the small farmers because it's easier administratively to all get a 100 acre farmer than it is a 2,000 acre farmer and you tick the box, which is farcical. And yeah. what you effectively should do, uh, my suggestion would be to, you, you tax bad, you know, potentially chemicals. Yeah. You, you, you're right, you, don't, you don't, and also it's easy to control that because only a few places producing the chemicals. There are farms everywhere. It just to me seems blindingly obvious and 
back in 98, I was doing environmental economics in part of my degree, mm -hmm. and I suggest a taxation system. We were looking at white goods and why people chose bridge freezers. And I suggested a taxation system that's based upon a multiplier for the warranty length and the energy efficiency. So five year warranty, 1% you know, taxation, and, and you know, so it inversely taxed against bad things. Mm. And my tutor, he said, I'm gonna send it off to David Pierce if you don't mind. And at the time, David Pierce did his, he did his PhD under David Pierce, and he was Tony Blair's environment advisor at the time. Mm. Yeah, we never heard nothing, of course, of it from then onwards, but mm. you wouldn't. Mm. Yeah, I think all I would say about land value taxation is I'm no expert in it, and and I and I don't, and I, I haven't got the wherewithal. I don't know enough about it to go into the detail of how it actually apply. I think what what I'm trying to outline here is the sort of radical agenda we can be looking at for the future, rather than the detail of how policies actually work in practice which of course has got to be done, it's fundamental, there's no point in introducing something that goes off half cock. Um, resource taxes, you know, the taxation of bads, fundamentally a good thing, and an, an obvious way to influence behaviour, and, and that, but that's quite mainstream thinking now. You know, there's already a series of taxes and things. Um, but I, I would actually go a little bit further than taxes and say, actually some things can be outlawed. You can just, it's not only a question of the, using the uh, financial mechanism, to make things more expensive, um, good though that is, some things we're going to say, well, actually, we just don't want those things around. Yeah. Ten more minutes, okay. Uh, yeah, I think all the, all the ideas you talk about are really good. I mean, we look at um, the sort of permaculture ethics as maybe as a guide, guiding principles, you know, the earth care, people yeah. care, and fair shares. And you could have that on, based on a commons based movement where stuff is held in common. You know, in order to protect it from private interests and privatisation. But it always comes back to, to this fundamental issue of how do you change these power structures? For example, you know, you talk about the House of Lords not representing um, people, they're not, rep they're not representing the planet, they're not representing people <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> you know, the party political process doesn't represent people, yeah. it just represents private interests. Mm. And, you know, fundamentally, really, always has. I mean, that's where the Marxist analysis is sort of correct in that respect, I think. So how do you move without there being some sort of revolution mm. to, a, to a situation where these things are possible? Because I don't think any of this is possible under the current parliamentary system that we have. I, well, well I, I agree. In this country, the, the lack of proportionality in the electoral system uh, is devastating. And you can just see that in those countries that have got a... A more proportional system, greens come through, and you see change affected. Despite all the vested interests, you do, you do start to see incremental change, and in some cases, quite rapid change. Um, so that 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 happens. Okay, we live in a country where you have not got a democratic electoral system, um, but there are things that can be done, and it's it's rather than just sort of, oh God, it's all impossible. Let's go home. It's actually looking at what the the routes forward are. Now, Greens can be elected at local, local government level. At local government level, it is possible to, to win under a first-past-the-post electoral system. So I, I would say, OK, Greens can actually do that. And where you've got Greens being elected, they're able to affect change. And in fact, there's one um, uh, major uh, district council, the whole of Brighton and Hove, which is run by the Green Party now. And that only happened, was it last year? So that's quite recent. And, and more councils could go Green. Um, there are other things within law. You can, um, it is possible for extra parliamentary groups to promote legislation. There's a guy called Ron Bailey who works Friends of the Earth. He does that. And there's the Road Traffic Production Bill, there's the Energy Conservation Bill, and there's been other bills that have actually been promoted from outside Parliament which have subsequently gone through Parliament. Um, we can also work locally. We can use the 1973 Local Government Act to have town polls, local referenda, to make sure there's more town meetings to make sure people get up and go to them. Um, I, would, I would say that one of the, the key uh, levers of change is just community action, engaging in your local community um, in whatever way you do, whether it's by setting up a new project, um, influencing the way people's shopping habits, uh, whether it's sitting on local councils, town councils or district councils. There's, there's always ways. And of course, there's lifestyle change. You know, we can all change the way we are. But fundamentally, it is about doing something, engaging, 
being empowered, empowering the people around us, and changing the discourse. I, I have a, a kind of a maxim which I apply to all my politics. I say you've got to do twice as much positive for negative. And actually you could even tip it more the other way. You could say maybe three times um, positive for every negative. Talk about the positive. Talk about the change that can be achieved. Because that's what motivates people. Okay, you do have to critique what's going on. But if you put too much emphasis on the negative, actually that disempowers people, it turns them off. So that is a, a kind of a little rule I apply in all my kind of community engagement. It's so much easier to get people motivated and engaged when you're putting forward something positive. It's one of the reasons I, I actually enjoy uh, party politics and have done. Well, except I don't like the word party, but I enjoy that because you're putting forward a manifesto. You're putting forward constructive ideas for how things can be changed. And it's not just the question of being against something. Yay? Um, uh, I'd like to uh, thank you very much for bringing up the um, issue of uh, being a voice for nature. Okay. And I think you've uh, inspired us all to try and look at what humans are doing through nature's eyes. And um, I, uh, that raises the very, very thorny issue of the biodiversity of this planet. And I'd like to speak up for biodiversity campaigning because biodiversity has become the poor relation of climate change. And the terrible news is that they are interdependent but separate problems are the ambassadors for nature. Let's please not forget the importance of ecology as a scientific discipline. Let's not dishonour the science that has brought us to this position of awareness of the dangers our planet is in. So please, um, with the spiritual, please take along with you all the science we know. Learn all the science you can, because it is through science that we are empowered to do something about it. Okay, I think it's probably just wrapping up time. It's pretty much wrapping up time. Well, I think one final thought, which I, I would leave you with, which is um, all of us individually, we're constantly changing and growing and evolving. And ultimately, political parties participation comes down to our own personal empowerment, our sense of self-worth, and that the personal is political. You know, I know that the feminists coined this phrase back in the 70s, but it really is fundamental. And when we look at personal healing on our own journeys in life, we can find sources of strength that can be used to really affect change in the wider community. And that is political. I just would like to leave the on that thought. Thank you all very much for coming. Well.